Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Wong, and I'm the Commercial Support Coordinator at the AAT. I'll be your host for today's Facebook Live event titled Becoming an Apprentice. So just to give you a bit of background about myself, I've been with AAT just over five years, and I support various functions within the company, including today's event. So an interesting fact about myself, um, I did once uh, do an apprenticeship many, many years ago in a slightly different industry to finance. Um, and I, I'm a huge advocate of work-based learning through intuition and on the job training. And my colleague Jaden, which you can't see on screen, will be on standby to control the slides and collect your questions throughout this event. And for your information, feel free to access our resources section that includes useful links and tips for securing your apprenticeship. Um, they include apprenticeship standards, for example, um, the levels of apprenticeships that we offer, they can see opportunities, case studies, and also some useful um, sort of tips about you know, salary earnings from the AUT survey as well. So we hope you find that useful. Um, so today we are joined by Ryan Abbott and Amy Forrest. Ryan is an apprentice at First Intuition who gives an insight from his perspective having completed his level three apprenticeship program last year and he's looking to commence his next level this year. Amy is the Managing Director at First Intuition East Anglia, and she will give us sort of an insight from her, um, you know, operational side from the employer training provider perspective. So welcome Ryan and welcome Amy on joining us today. Really great to have you both on today's event. I'm sure both of you have such a great wealth of knowledge to share and tips to tell us as well. Now, for members of the audience joining us live today, please do send us your questions, including questions for our guests, for both Amy and Ryan, and we'll endeavour to answer as many questions as we can towards the end. Um, Jaden, if you can bring us to our next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, so Amy, I thought I'll start to begin with you and, you know, to take us through the initial steps of becoming an apprentice. But before we proceed on that subject, um, can you please tell us a bit more about yourself and your current role? Thank you very much. Nice to see you, Wong, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, my name's Amy Forrest, and as Wong said, I am the Managing Director at First Intuition in East Anglia. And First Intuition is an accountancy training provider, and we train students and apprentices in their AAT studies. So I actually am an accountant myself as well. So I trained as an accountant and I did that whilst working in accounts practice. So a lot of my role involved preparing sets of accounts for external companies, doing things like bookkeeping, doing things like VAT returns, company secretarial work. So I studied for my accounting qualifications whilst I worked. However, back in my day, apprenticeships didn't exist. If they did, I would have been an apprentice. That was a, a, a model that a lot of accounting firms used. So I joined First Intuition nine years ago now as a tutor. So I was teaching our professional qualifications. And because I, my background is in accounts practice and accountancy standard setting, my specialism was in financial accounting. So I taught a lot of those kind of papers. From there, it was around 2017 when apprenticeships had a big revolution in how they work, what they're offering people and how they work as a as a training option. And as such, from there, I then went on to roll out our apprenticeship programmes across East Anglia. So developing the programmes for apprentices to join and have a different option and way to study. Our apprenticeships became quite big and as such my role evolved and now I'm managing director across East Anglia so I get to look and work with our centres across Cambridge, Peterborough, Norwich and Ipswich but I'm involved in the wider FI network as well where we have 23 centres across England, London, Birmingham, uh, Liverpool, Bristol, Reading, so a lot of centres so my background is definitely accountancy and apprenticeships are a big passion of mine. Fantastic. Thanks you so much for that, Amy. That was quite detailed and lots of experience from there as well. I mean, you, you like you said, you're a managing director. Um, how, how do you sort of, um, sort of, you know, manage your day? Because you're always seeing so many different sites and centres. How do you go about managing that? 
you know what? It's one of my favourite things of part of my role is that my role is very, very varied. So I get to do lots of different things and get involved in a number of different teams. And I'm really grateful and, and um, happy that at First Intuition, I'm surrounded by lots of fantastic people. So I get to work with a lot of the directors and managers and people like Ryan running the different departments. So my day could be, as you say, I could be at a meeting down in London. I could be at an event like this, getting to speak. I could be at an internal meeting looking at how we operate. Um, so very varied, but I'm surrounded by a lot of fantastic people to help with that. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Amy. And can, can you please um, explain a bit more about the role of a training provider within an apprenticeship scheme? Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I said apprenticeships came out in 2017. There was a type of apprenticeship before, but a big revolution. So really, we talk about apprenticeships as being from 2017. And at that point in 2017, when they came out, apprenticeships really made a big deal about apprenticeships being a kind of three way relationship in that when we're looking at an apprenticeship, we've obviously got the apprentice looking to study and gain the qualification. We've got the employer providing the employment opportunity and giving them practical experience at work. But we've also got the training provider providing the courses and the support and the study for achieving that qualification. So training providers are one piece of the puzzle of an apprenticeship. So what we would do at First Intuition is we would provide the formal training in the knowledge, skills and behaviours that an apprentice needs in order to gain their qualification. We'll support the apprentice with coaching, undertaking progress reviews, keeping people on track, setting targets for the next couple of months. And we are really there to help the apprentice meet the requirements of the programme. As you can imagine, being a government funded programme, um, employers are gaining, uh, utilising government funding to pay for these courses. There are certain requirements that need to be met. So, for example, um, students would need to keep a timesheet of where they have undertaken some learning. So the role of the training provider is primarily providing those training courses. So for us, AAT level two, level three, level four, we provide training in skills and behaviours. And we'll come on to that later about those skills and behaviours, but we provide training in that as well. And we provide support to the apprentice in terms of coaching, target setting and keeping on track. Perfect. Yeah, well explained there, Amy. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Jaden, if you can go on to the next slide for us, please. Perfect. So this is uh, looking at sort of the top tips for securing an apprenticeship. And, uh, you know, this is something that we find often questions get asked at careers events, for example, or it could be something that you, maybe you hosted at an event from one of your first intuition centres, Amy. So sort of step one uh, is sort of whether the side whether an apprenticeship is for you, uh, weigh up your options. So it goes without saying, you know, many people from different backgrounds come from, you know, wealth of, you know, uh, knowledge and experiences, work-based, or it could be a totally different career. Uh, what would you say would be sort of the benefits of choosing an apprenticeship, let's say over, you know, something more academic like university, for example, which is quite common, um, or someone who's looking to get um, a higher diploma, but normally sort of like, more academic as opposed to apprenticeship. What, what would you say to that, Amy? I think, you know, it's a it's a big choice for people, isn't it? Next steps, university, a different way into study, apprenticeships and so on and so forth. Now, I am a big advocate for apprenticeships, but I understand, you know, people, it is a big choice for people. One of the big benefits of apprenticeship programmes is earning while you learn. You know, you are in a job role, you are undertaking that job, you are... Um, getting that monthly paycheck or whatever it is. And at the same time, the employer is sponsoring you, giving you study leave to go and gain a qualification. I mean, that is fantastic. That is fantastic. So, you know, one of the big differences between university and apprenticeship programme is obviously you pay to go to university. Often people will um, get, rack up some student debt associated with that. Whereas in an apprenticeship programme, you're actually paid to work and paid at the same time to go and learn and earn your qualification. So earning while you learn, that's got to be a big one. Uh, that's right, yeah. And it sounds too good to be true, isn't it? I mean, it's it sounds like, um, you know, you're you enrolled in this programme, you get an on job training, like you said, you get an experience, um, you've got that room to make, you know, errors and be corrected by a sort of mentor coach. Um, you're getting a salary as well. And at the end of it, you get, you know, hopefully a permanent position at the end with the employer. Um, and you can progress from there as well. So it does sound to be good, too good to be true in that sense there. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of 
you know, on to our next point here, searching and identifying an opportunity, um, we sort of look at, you know, from, from the apprentice's eyes, let's say, or someone who's pr pr prospectus to looking for an apprenticeship, um, what are sort of the requirements, would you say, for a candidate looking to apply for an apprenticeship? Is there specific requirements that they need? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. And actually, a big reason why I went into accountancy myself is I personally didn't want to go to university um, mm -hmm. and so I left school with GCSEs and A-levels and actually I didn't have anything like a business A-level or an accounting A-level but accountancy was still a really good option for me and that's something that I actually think is quite good about an accountancy career and an accountancy apprenticeship is that you don't have to have done particular A-levels, GCSEs or a degree to get into that, um, that role. However, what I would say is that employers do set their own minimum requirements and sometimes training providers might set their own minimum requirements. It's very, very common that employers will look for, in particular, GCSEs in maths and English. That's a that's a really common one to look for, actually. Um, and as part of the apprenticeship program, whilst you don't need to have a C or a level four or above in maths and English GCSE, if you didn't have that, you would need to undertake what's called a functional skill, skills qualification programme. So talk about kind of background. Really, I've worked with people that have got degrees in a language or geography or have done A-levels in photography or art or whatever it is. It's just on your CV. If you do have more relevant qualifications, things like business, GCSE, maths and English, economics, potentially, um, Sometimes people have accountancy, but that can mean that you can't sign up to an apprenticeship programme because of eligibility rules. Um, generally, employers will set their own requirements. OK, good stuff there, Amy. Um, the next one we have is applying for a position. So I, I guess this is the point where the potential apprentice is looking to make that step. Um, they, they've sourced out a vacancy in a local area, let's say, um, and they found a suitable position or an opportunity. What, but, you know, there, there's, there's quite a lot of things that go into this. So it's like, mm -hmm. for example, preparing your CV, your resume, a uh, cover letter, um, you know, just, just getting prepared for initially making that first step and, and so, you know, aiming to get that interview. Um, but what would you say would be sort of, you know, the very essential tips that a potential apprentice can take on, in, during that phase? I would say first things first, the, your CV is really important. Make sure you take the time to write it. There's loads of advice online about how to structure your CV and make sure that's good to good to go. Um, indeed, the job searching website has a stat that the average employer will look at a CV for around six to seven seconds. So that's how long you have to make a quick impact. So whilst the content of the CV is really, really important, making sure you've got all your experiences down, how it's relevant and so on, the structure of the CV is important. Make sure it's laid out properly. You know, if you've got a kind of big jumble of words, no spacing out, no nice paragraphs, I bet that's going to be one of the ones rejected in that six to seven seconds. If it's set out nicely, you've got your experience clearly shown, uh, you're probably going to have a bit more of a look at that one. So that's my first top tip, I'd say. My next top tip I'd say with applying for a position is make sure you have actually tailored your CV and covering letter to the job you're applying for. Now, I've reviewed a lot of CVs in my time and one of the uh, worst things you can see is someone's applied for a job and we might be asking for somebody to do a business administration role and they might say, oh, I'm really passionate about becoming a dog walker. I'm like, well, hold on. <laughs> yeah, that's not the job you've applied for here. So make sure it's tailored to the job you're going for, because what you want is to show the employer that you are interested. You care. You've taken the time to um, tailor your CV and what you do for the employer. So they should take the time to read your CV. So number one thing I'd say, CV is really, really important. That's really great, um, Amy. And, and, and also, you know, for, for members of our viewing audience, let's say they've, they've taken those steps to, you know, 
really great, get, get a, a smashing CV, let's say, but they've, they've made, you know, lots of applications and they're just not getting as many responses or they, they get rejections, let's say. Um, what, what tips and advice would you give to someone in that scenario? Yeah, it, it's one of those challenges, isn't it? You, I'm sure everybody's heard of a friend or a colleague or someone moved into a job and they've sent out a hundred applications. So first things first, I'd say, just keep going. You've got to keep applying for things. But secondly, maybe look at how and where you're applying. You know, if you've been trying going through a recruitment website, which can be really, really good, by the way, Indeed, Read, all of those kind of websites, they can be fantastic. Maybe try another route. Maybe try going directly through the employer's website. Maybe try looking for accountancy jobs and going on to the employer's website and sending your CV directly. Maybe try talking to a recruitment agent. Maybe try looking at things like not going to uni or UCAS, who are now promoting apprenticeships, or um, the National Apprenticeship website. I would say use lots of different options to try and get your name out there and get your name in front of employers. Really great stuff there. No, I think I think that's really useful tips as well because we often do get those questions coming in um, from from those um, audience members that do they they do take those steps and they feel like maybe they missed out something in in the end there. Um, so I think what you just said there, Amy, really highlights that, and I, we we hope that you know that that's useful for the audience members as well from there. Um, now the next one we come on to is interviews. So cut down to So so Amy, without giving too much away from first and two point of view, I appreciate you might be closely uh involved in the recruitment process but is there sort of um any advice you can give in terms of um you know that that side of things basically absolutely absolutely first things first dress code you know i would say make sure that you're dressed appropriately for the interview whether that's online or face to face at the employer's premises or uh, somewhere else you know make sure generally follow what the employer's dress code is but don't go too casual. You know, if their website's looking like they wear lots of hoodies and jeans and so on, I'd always err to being slightly too smart than too casual. And generally in accounting practices and accounting firms, it is, it is more formal. You know, generally people are wearing shirts and smarter wear. In terms of the interview itself, you can prepare. You can prep so much for an interview. So I, I don't mind saying this, but I, the number one question we will always ask at first intuition, guaranteed in an interview, someone will sit down and will say, tell me a bit about yourself. And you know it's coming. You know it's the first question that's coming. And that's not just us at first intuition. That's every employer will pretty much say, tell me a bit about yourself. Tell me why you're interested in this role. You know that's coming. And the employer wants a good 90 second to two minute conversation from yourself where you're high, you know, really showcasing you as an individual. It's often called an elevator pitch. So if you're looking for tips online, look for an elevator pitch about yourself. The next thing I'd say about interviewing, though, make sure you've researched the company because they are also pretty much guaranteed to ask you, oh, what do you know about first intuition? What do you know about the AAT? And you just want to be able to show that you have been on the website. You've done a bit of research. Can you say what they do? Can you say where they're based? Can you maybe slip in there a couple of the accolades that the company's got? I always love it when people reference that we've got an Ofsted Outstanding Grade or we've been Training Provider of the Year. It goes a long way because I know that someone's done that bit of research. But my biggest tip that I would say is you are going to have to be your biggest advocate. I think sometimes we can all slide into being a bit, oh, I'm not that good at that. Or, oh, you know, I could have done that better. OK, maybe that's the case. But the interview is not the time to say that. The interview is where you're showcasing what you're fantastic at. Why should they choose you to work at this company? And my last tip I'd say is about making sure you've got some questions for them. People love being asked questions. People love being asked questions about their company. People are often very passionate about what they do. So not only are you asking questions to show an interest, 
but you should have some questions. You should have some questions because you are also making the choice about whether you want to work at that employer. So have some questions ready. The last thing I want to say is there is so much online with interview tips and I would really recommend looking at it. We've got a whole section on our First Intuition website about how to prepare because they're really important. Um, but those are some things from me anyway. Perfect, Amy. Yeah, I mean, you literally took the words out of my mouth. I mean, the questions part at the end, I thought that was really, really useful. It just shows what the company um, is, you know, when it comes to the apprentice asking the questions, it just means that the company is aware, okay, they're quite interested in us and they want to know more about what's involved in the team. You know, ask questions out there. Um, it could be, you know, how big is the team in the company? What's involved? Um, do I have a mentor? How does the mentor training scheme works? So, you know, ask questions, ask away. It just shows that you've got interest in there from there as well. Cool. And the next one we have from points five is onboarding with an employer. So this is essentially at the point where, let's say the apprentice has successfully, you know, they've concluded the interview, the employer likes what they see, and they, they are essentially enrolled them for the apprenticeship program. So Amy, can you take us through essentially what an onboarding process looks like with an employer typically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously it varies by employers. You'll find that very large employers will have a much more structured, probably a much longer onboarding. Maybe smaller employers might be slightly less, but all employers have some form of onboarding. And that is that first day, that first couple of weeks of when somebody has joined an employer. So first thing I'd say is when you join an employer, there's often quite a bit of reading. Not only have you had to read all of the contract before you started with the employer, but then you'll join and they'll say, could you read our staff handbook? Could you read our policies on this, that and the other? Could you read? And it's important. You know, they're trying to get you up to speed with the general policies that the company follows. So there's quite a bit of reading. So prepare for that. I personally, when I've joined employers, like to spread that out and make sure that I'm interspersing it with other tasks. Secondly, you're going to be meeting loads of people. You know, generally in that onboarding phase, you get introduced to the rest of your team. Fantastic. Your line manager, your supervisor, other people in the team that you're going to be working with, but also other people from other teams. Now, accountancy is often a role where you do end up working with lots of teams around a company. So it's really important you start to build those relationships. So take those opportunities. Now, if there are events to go and meet people, if there's coffee at this time, go and attend that coffee. If people are organising a social, try and get to that. Try and say hello to people and make those meetings. Next thing I'd say is that in the first couple of weeks of um, uh, starting in a new role, there's often a lot of initial training that the employer will put you on. Things like health and safety, things like GDPR. Sometimes we have to do, for example, fire training at first intuition as a training provider. Really make sure you do that training. Um, it's, you know, as accountants, we're held to our ethical code. And as our ethical code, if someone asks us to do some training to do our role, professional behaviour tells us we should really be doing that training and make sure you do it by the date that's been set. You don't want one of the first few interactions with HR in your company to be then chasing you because you haven't done something. So make sure you keep to the keep to the dates. Um, You'll also in the first couple of weeks be set your first few tasks, you know, a few things to start getting on with, maybe a bit of bookkeeping that you might be involved in. Maybe you'll start looking at how things are structured file wise. Maybe you'll start doing some notes for a client meeting, something like that. But my number one tip that I would say for when you're looking at onboarding. Take a notepad with you or use notes on your computer or whatever it is take notes like there's no tomorrow just note down everything that's being said because there is so much in that first couple of weeks it can sometimes be overwhelming but take lots of notes so you can refer back to it when somebody is showing you a task for the first time in accountancy they will want to see you taking notes because it shows you're taking it seriously and it shows when you go to ask them a question their first response won't be well why didn't you note this down they'll be will more willing to help so number one tip take lots of notes yeah, I can certainly relate to that as well, Amy. I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a sort of a note taker myself, but I do, I'm not guilty of not often taking notes and I feel like I, I do get lost with gaps. Um, there's a lot of things going on, obviously, during the induction, quite a lot of things to take in, but as long as you're proactive, you're, you're taking that approach, you network, like you mentioned, um, you should be fine as well. And, you know, that's the whole point of an apprenticeship is that you might not have the answers, but you've got a team around you there to support you and take you through your journey as well.
Cool. And then the final point is undertake an, an apprenticeship. So what's in sort of involved there? So you kind of touched upon those points earlier, Amy, just so we give a, a little bit of understanding for our members of audience, what is all the general undertaking um, as a student going through their journey? What, what, what was involved throughout that sort of program? Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's a good question um, because it's slightly different to being a, a kind of paid for student. The government is now funding your training. And as such, as you can imagine, any time that the government is funding something, there are going to be forms to complete to gather that. The government wants to know the money that is being spent is for the right thing. So a big part of undertaking apprenticeship, what's involved is the sign up paperwork. You're going to have a number of forms to complete asking you what's your education history? What background have you got? Looking at different skills that you might, might have, what kind of stage are they at? Make sure you've got copies of your exam certificates ready to send to your training provider. So first things first, do expect that at the start there's quite a lot of forms you need to fill in, but that's great. You know, you have to do that. The government have to set that to make sure the funding's being used appropriately. Next thing, once that's complete, if you're signed up as an AAT apprentice, you must make sure you register with the AAT as an apprentice. Really important to do early on so you can make sure that you've got access to the um, online learning portal. There's some fantastic resources on the AAT website to let the AAT know you are an apprentice. So they're getting ready for you to do your exams and so on and so forth. Make sure you register with the AAT. What I would say is if you go for a level two or level three apprenticeship, you must talk about this with your uh, with your training provider because they will provide you with the codes in order to uh, register. Next thing, with undertaking an apprenticeship, the overall thing in an apprenticeship is that somebody is developing significant new knowledge, skills and behaviours. That's the base requirement. So in an apprenticeship programme, you'll be undertaking your AAT qualification as you go through the next year or whatever of your apprenticeship programme. Apprenticeship programmes are usually somewhere between 15 to 18 months you're looking at, and that is per level. So during that time, you'll be developing your knowledge, your skills and your behaviours by undertaking your AAT qualification, by undertaking training in skills and behaviours, things like communication, things like decision making, problem solving, proactivity, all of those things that are going to turn you from a good accountant into a great accountant. At the same time as doing that, you need to evidence that. You need to evidence that you have gained those knowledge, skills and behaviours. That will come from passing your AAT exams. So you'll go on your AAT courses and you will pass your AAT exams. It will come from providing evidence of work based um, learning. So, for example, if you have done a communication skills training session, you might want you should probably then be going back to the workplace and saying, and here's a great example of where I've improved my email communication. This is why I did it. And this is the impact. So it's showing the evidence of you implementing the skills and behaviours. Alongside with undertaking an apprenticeship, one of the government rules, and I say it's a government rule, but it's really making sure that as an apprentice, you get what you're entitled to, and it's a quality apprenticeship. The government require that you spend 20% of your time learning. 20% of your time must be spent on things like going on training courses, undertaking new things in the workplace, shadowing other people observing something new, i.e. any of those things where you're learning something new can contribute to that 20% requirement. But again, you're required to show that. So you need to keep a timesheet of things you've done that show that learning. But honestly, at first intuition, we have all the templates set up. It is really easy. It sounds like a lot of paperwork, but it's all there ready to go. You just need to get in good habits of doing that. At the end of an apprenticeship programme, though, you reach what's called your endpoint assessment. And that's your final exam where you'll showcase your portfolio of work, where you'll undertake an interview or a discussion um, and show that you have done what you need to do on apprenticeship and have gained all of those fantastic knowledge, skills and behaviours. So it's quite different to just studying, uh, uh, you know, outside of an apprenticeship. But I think apprenticeships really do provide that more rounded that, you know, you, you come out with much more rounded skills. So I think they're a fantastic way to study.
Fantastic. Thanks for that again, Amy. And also, please do check out First Intuition's resources section in um, sort of the box below or around us uh, it, it, where you're looking from. But it does include a free student event such as webinars, revision sessions, and also their First Intuition podcast as well. Um, any questions for Amy, please also feel free to add them to the chat box as well. We'll endeavor to sort of uh, triage it to her as well towards the end. Uh, Jaden, if you can go to our next slide, please. Thank you. So what we're looking at is a linear diagram of the apprenticeship process. Um, so what you're looking at from the left hand side going to the right hand side is essentially what happens after you've secured your apprenticeship program. So you're onboarding. So as Amy described earlier, you go through the uh, phase of getting to know the employer, um, getting to know the, the tra uh, training provider as well. And then from there, it's just a case of doing the onboarding um, on programming learning. So you will learn about the knowledge, you learn about the skills, um, and you'll build up your portfolio. So typically, as Amy described earlier, it's normally about 12 months and above. Um, and then from there, it's typically just obviously registering as a student member, <clears throat> sorry. And then from there, we have sort of the gateway. So the gateway is a decision that's taken between the apprentice and the employer as to whether they're ready to go through the endpoint assessment, as Amy described earlier. Um, so that's sort of a linear diagram there, just showing you over what the pro apprenticeship process looks like. Um, typically, as you know, as, 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 as Amy mentioned before, it's 20 percent so, uh, tuition provider based and then 80 percent of it is with the on the job training with the employer. OK, and then Jenny, if you can go to the next slide for me, please. Perfect. So in the slide, uh, this shows the diagram. Um, in terms of the relationship between the various parties working in harmony with each other. So you've got the three main stakeholders within the scenario of completing an apprenticeship. So at the top, you've, you've got the apprentice uh, who will be learning and training whilst on an apprenticeship scheme salary. And then on the left hand side, you've got the employer who will nurture, mentor and train the apprentice. They'll cover the skills and behaviours elements. And then from there, the apprentice will draw upon and use those experiences to reflect on their portfolio. And then on the right hand side, we have the training provider seen in the right hand side. So, I mean, that provide the tuition for the AT qualification. So essentially the knowledge aspect of it. So this is where you undertake assessments as well for each unit on there. And in the center, we have us at AET. So, so AET is essentially the central point for all the connections between the three um, stakeholders there. Hope that makes sense. But Amy, from, from your point of view, is that is that more or less accurate from, from your side? Yeah, absolutely. It's that those three P, those three groups, the apprentice, the employer, and the train provider, and absolutely the AAT qualification is really important within that. It's a very highly regarded qualification. And actually you'll see a, a lot on CVs and job requirements that the AAT is there. So at level two and level three, you're required to undertake that AAT um the AAT programme, same at level four, but that's usually set by employers uh, that they want people to undertake that. So absolutely agree with you there, Wong. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Amy. Uh, Jaden, if you can bring us to our next slide, please. And this brings up uh, brings us to Ryan. So Ryan, thank you so much for, again for joining us today's event there. How are you today? Uh, I'm good, thank you. I'll try and uh, I'll try and be as happy as I look in that photo. But uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> Fantastic. I know, I know you mentioned uh, before we joined is um, that that hairstyle that you had. Was that was uh, that taken a while back? Yeah. Well, yeah, two years ago now. Two so. years ago. Wow. Okay. Well, you look fantastic ago, anyway. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Not to worry at all. Um. So yeah, Ryan. Um. Th you know. With your experience as a, you know an apprentice and, and still to go on apprentice this year, uh, we obviously welcome any sort of advice you can give to our members of audience about what they can expect as doing an apprenticeship or, or any sort of tips of becoming an apprentice. Because I could imagine that when you applied, you probably went through the the you know the struggles and obviously the sort of rejections, and you probably had some sort of obstacles in your path there. Um, but before we go on to that, can you please tell us about you know a bit about yourself and about your current role yeah so uh as Wong previously mentioned i've part i've sat and passed my level three apprenticeship so just like when that picture was taken that uh, is about two years ago now when i first joined first intuition so yeah it's been quite quite an experience um i never really I always sort of in the back of my mind wanted to do an apprenticeship, but before that I actually went to university and I sort of got into that, got into that thinking of, Hey, this is not really for me. It's not 
really what I want to be doing. I think I've sort of fell into that, fell into that thinking of, well, everyone around me sees, seems to be going to university. It seems to be a trend at the minute. It must be the right thing to do. So I think there'll probably be a few other people out there watching this now that might be thinking the same thing. Um, but once I'd sort of settled down, once I came back from my first year about Christmas time, I sort of realised wasn't for me. Uh, so once I saw, once I decided that I didn't want to complete my uh, university, I decided to withdraw. And then I sort of over the Christmas break, I sort of had to think about what do I want to do? I don't really want to get pinned down in one job role and be there for the rest of my life. I want to pick something where I can progress and move forward, get qualified, get paid, you know, earn a high salary and, you know, stick with a solid career for the rest of the rest of my life. And I also sort of have it in the blood uh, as my mum is also an accountant and did her AAT qualifications. Uh, so, she was also sort of egging me on to do the same thing. Um, but yeah, so I've been with First Intuition for two years now. I finished my level three, finished my level three uh, end of November. So I then decided that I wanted to continue and progress and move on to level four, which I'm currently filling out all that paperwork that Amy, uh, Amy previously mentioned, uh, which is important to get it done, get it done on time. Uh, so yeah, that's where I'm currently at, should be starting uh i believe about march april time my level four yeah nice and that's yeah that's around the corner so i mean it, yeah i mean that wealth of background that you had um the family member like your mom egging you on um that really helps around your close circles that really pushes you to motivate you to get an apprenticeship so yeah i mean that i think that would echo with um sort of our viewing audience as well because they may have someone sort of you know motivating them to apply for an apprenticeship and where well, it was all early 2024 so you know what's stopping you know you from applying for an apprenticeship so make that your dream make that happen this year because you know time goes quick and you don't want to miss out on any potential opportunities out there um so this is a bit of a funny one because uh you know ryan you're an apprentice um at first intuition and you're also um obviously you know studying with first intuition as well so how did the opportunity came about yeah so um like i said when i sort of uh when i withdrew from uni i began sort of job searching as i you know mum didn't want me to just live at home and uh live off her the rest of my life uh so what I found is I looked on, I was on Indeed looking for jobs, looking for something. I didn't know what I wanted to do really, but I know I knew, well, I knew it. I wanted to do something with accountancy, but the sort of specifics of it, I was still a bit here and there of what I wanted to do. So I really wanted to pick a role that was, you know, encompassed quite a lot. So, you know, I applied at other places, but when I found First Intuition and uh, bringing up family members again my mum did actually used to freelance for first intuition as well so a bit more a bit more close relations but uh yeah once I found uh first intuition I think I actually found I remember my mum sending me the Facebook ad for it so you just it just pops up it it just pops up anywhere you know social media these days with adverts and things but yeah once I'd um once I'd seen the uh advertisement and sort of dove a little bit deeper into what first intuition was uh, and what they do I realized it was quite quite a close team you know reading all the reviews uh checking out all the website and I, well hearing about it off off my mum as well I'll keep bringing her up uh she'd love that uh but yeah just <laughs> uh sorry I'm making myself laugh uh but yeah once I sort of just found the role researched it decided you know this sounds good dove a bit in deeper and then i moved on to the uh recruitment process and uh sorting out my cv and such perfect yeah thanks for that ryan and and in you know in terms of uh you know going through the interview how did you find the interview process like well, was it hard was it easy or was it something that you know you can sort of depart any sort of wisdom and knowledge when you went through that um so i found it quite tough because I'd never I'd never actually written a covering letter or a CV before so I was you know on on your Google on YouTube what what do I need to say what does it need to look like uh, so I spent a bit of time working on that um, a bit of time 
relating, like Amy said, it's important to relate your covering letter to what you're actually applying for. Getting experienced people like my parents to read it over. Um, so, you know, getting that, that second moment of making yourself feel better and knowing what you're writing and what you're saying in your CV and covering letter is actually correct. Um, so once I got over that hurdle, built my CV, built my covering letter. So then I emailed over my application to First Intuition, kept rereading what I'd you know written, made my email very formal, very clear. You know, you don't need to blabber on about all your experience. Well, all your sort of anything that's not irrelevant, because like Amy said, you know, it, they're not going to read it and it's not going to make them feel any different. Um, so once, once I set in my application, uh, I got an email from uh, Tracy, who's now my line manager, saying that she'd like me to come in for an interview at this time. Would I be able to make it? Then you just need to make sure you can make it, get there on time, 15 minutes early. Not too early because then you look too eager. Um, but earlier is obviously better than later. Um, once I came in for that, face-to-face -face interview. So I had that with my line manager um, and another colleague of mine. And then we moved on to the actual interview. So like Amy said, first question, spoiler alert, it is probably going to be about, tell me a bit about yourself. So then you are promoting yourself, um, which I mean, sometimes I can talk for England. Um, so I managed to clearly I must have done something right in there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you just need to promote yourself. Uh, I mean, you've got all the information there and you're covering letter and your CV of what, what you've done in life, what experiences you've had, what, what qualifications you have that are relevant. Um, and you just need to, you just need to be yourself because you can't pretend to be someone else in an interview and then get the job and keep being someone else. You just need to be yourself. Um, and I, it was the first sort of, um, the first sort of formal and proper interview I'd had really. I mean, I had one for like university and like a bike or everything. Um, but sort of that, that first interview when you're sat down opposite two people and you're promoting yourself, it is quite nervy. I did sort of stumble over a couple of questions. Um, but once you start, once you get into it, I mean, it's so easy to just flow on. You get more confident with more que with each question uh, as they come through. Um, and then once my interview had concluded, uh, I waited uh, very nervously and with a lot of hope that I'd get a phone call back that was a positive one. Uh, and I did. Uh, and then, yeah, then that sort of begun the, uh, the journey that I'm on now. Perfect. Thanks, Ryan. I think that, that was really quite inspirational for how, how you sort of succeeded in getting, you know, the stage of that apprenticeship and look at where you are right now. So it's, it worked out for you in the end. Um, finally, ha have you got any sort of advice for someone looking to embark on an apprenticeship, Ryan? Any sort of last words or advice? Yeah. So um, what I found very important um, that I, I've always been this sort of person, but I've sort of maybe unprepared myself for what I was going into, but I'd say my most important tip would be to be organized, be on top of things, set deadlines that are realistic. Um, like Amy's previously mentioned, those timesheets um, and those sort of submission tasks just show that all the knowledge that you learn, do them on time, get someone else to read them over. Um, and yeah, definitely being organized, getting stuff in your calendar of what you've got coming up. Um, yeah, I'd definitely say being organized um, and just keeping on top of stuff because falling behind and having to say to someone, look, I haven't got that done because I've been doing this isn't, you know, when you haven't previously warned them that you might have stuff coming up, it's a bit of a sticky situation to get yourself in that's easily avoidable. So yeah, I'd say definitely my top tip is to be organized. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Ryan. I really appreciate the uh, wealth of advice you gave there for your experience. Hope everything goes well with your next level of your apprenticeship. It's a level four, isn't it? Starting in March. Yeah, right? level four. That's a lot of bad, mate. I'm sure you'll smash it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Perfect. Well, I, I hope that's uh, plenty of food for thought today. And uh, without further ado, let's get to the questions uh, that you submitted during this Facebook live event. So just bear with me. Uh, we'll just go through um, sort of questions submitted so far. Um, so the first question we have here is, um, are apprenticeships age restricted? So I think, Amy, you I think you maybe alluded earlier that there isn't age restrictions. However, it depends on the uh, the training provider. Is that right? So one of the big um, changes with apprenticeships back in 2017 was that apprenticeships are to upskill and to reskill. So apprenticeships in the old days used to be for people aged 16 to 24. That doesn't exist anymore. So if you're 16 plus, you could be uh, have just done your GCSEs looking for a role. You could have just done your A-levels looking for a role. You could be mid-30s looking for a career change. The, there is no age restriction for an apprenticeship. But what I would say is what you need to be careful with is on an apprenticeship, you have to develop significant new knowledge, skills and behaviours. So if somebody has been working as a bookkeeper for 10 years, they've got great communication skills, they might supervise somebody else. You're not going to get onto a level two apprenticeship because you already have it. You know, you already have what you should gain on an apprenticeship program. Um, so that's the key requirement, knowledge, skills and behaviours, but there's no age requirement anymore, which is really exciting. So upskilling and reskilling. Perfect. Thanks, Amy. The next question we have is, um, I'm just reading what it says. Here. So I'm a mum, so my time is very restricted. Would an apprenticeship still work for me or are they full time or part time apprenticeships available? So uh, is this for me, Wong? Sorry. It probably does. Yeah, I think it reads out for you. Amy. <laughs> no worries. I was just going to, I'm going into arts mode. It's the tutor in me coming out. Um, <laughs> So you have to be able to evidence 20% of your time to off the job learning. Now that does flex for if you are not in a full time job. So you can be in a part time role and still go and undertake that. There may be an extension to your program to make sure you still have enough time to gain the knowledge, skills and behaviours. So first of all, the legal requirements, you can still do it as part time. Absolutely, you can. Uh, there might just be you might just be on a longer program to make sure you've had enough time to have experiences. Um, apprenticeship programs, it's a lot of work, you know, it's like gaining a professional qualification, your employer will give you time to study during work hours. Um, Ryan, for example, you did your level three courses, and you must have had 25 days that were given to you to kind of go and study. Fantastic. But what the employer isn't going to do is say, right, for that exam, or is highly unlikely to do, you can have another five days off to revise. There is an element of revising in your home time. Um, so you would need to make sure you can balance that. And I, I completely understand what you're saying. You know, if there are home pressures, you do need to look at how you can balance um, the uh, your requirements to be at home and your requirements to study. Um, so just go into it aware, I would say it is an option, it is available, but be aware you would need to study outside of work hours too. Thanks again, Amy. The next question we have is, can you sign up for an apprenticeship if you've already signed up for a college? Um, my, my, my probably initial impression is, uh, I mean, if, if, because, you know, apprenticeships are full time, as we know. So if this person um, has phrased it as they've already studying already at college, but they want to do an apprenticeship in addition to that. Uh, my impression is they have to do one thing or the other. Correct me if I'm wrong, Amy. No, they would. Uh, somebody needs to be working at an employer's. So often college is a full time, um, full time venture, which is great. So someone might go to college full time. Fantastic. But you need to be with an employer who's providing an apprenticeship program. So that's the first part of it. You need to be employed and available to do that. The second thing to note there, that question sometimes get asked when someone says, I've already done some, I've already done an accounting degree or I've already done accounting in college. Can I still do an apprenticeship? I know I keep coming back to this, but this is the rule. You have to have significant new knowledge, skills and behaviours. So if someone has an accounting degree, which is equivalent to what's called a level five qualification, we cannot put them on an AAT level two, three or four apprenticeship. We, we are allowed to from the funding rules the reason for that is quite honestly you'll already have got a lot of the knowledge so if the question here is i've already done an accounting a level can i still do it 
maybe it'll just depend which level you go into it's highly unlikely you'd be able to do a level two maybe a level three but it depends what you've actually covered in your accounting qualification okay thanks again for that amy um next question we have is in an apprenticeship do i pay them or do they pay me i think ryan you're probably best to answer that question because you've been through an apprenticeship but what's your take on that um so well in my experience with first intuition i've not had to um pay which is obviously bonus for me not so much first intuition uh but yeah so i know that some some of the other employers we have um i think there's different rules i'm not sure if amy might be able to um add any more information to this but i know a couple of the uh other employers that we sort of work with i know they offer to uh, i believe that they pay for the first exam that their um student or apprentices or apprentice is going to sit um and then if it doesn't go so well then the student has to pay for the reset um i know we have a couple of them amy uh but me personally uh i've not had to really pay a penny which is quite good and then like when i sign when you sign up you have to pay for your aat membership um which then I just made an expense claim for uh, with First Intuition uh, and they paid me back. Perfect. Thanks for that, Ryan. Um, and there's another interesting question that we have here. So what disbars you from becoming an apprentice? So I'm not quite sure I answered that question correctly. So um, my, my assumption is maybe if this person may be from an international background, let's say. So um, ideally, you would need to have, let's say, a GCSE in maths and English or something equivalent, like a functional skills, I would say. And you would have to be at least in the UK uh, and for the past, like, let's say, three years uh, for tax purposes. So, Amy, is, is there is anything else uh, that you want to wish to add to that? You know, again, what disbars you from becoming an apprentice? Yeah, a few, a few things on this. Firstly, um, you mentioned about GCSEs. So we would need evidence of somebody undertaking the qualification in their home country. And we can go through a process to get that matched up to uh, the English related qualification to understand that that is uh, will exempt you from doing what's called functional skills. So that's the first piece. Next thing is that you need to be working in and live uh, in England for 50 percent of your time. So you need to be living, working in England to be on an apprenticeship program. The third thing is you need to be able to show that you are eligible to live in England for the duration of your apprenticeship program. So make sure that if you're on a visa or something, it does cover the full time because what the government don't want is they start someone on an apprenticeship program and then they can't stay in the country, so they can't complete. So you need to make sure you've got the time to um, complete your apprenticeship and that's covered by your visa. In terms of being disbarred though, I mean, those are the very, very basic technical requirements apprenticeships are very open to a lot of people you know i would really encourage anybody that's listening who's thinking oh i'm not quite sure if i'm eligible get in contact with us at first intuition get in contact with your chosen training provider because we'll be able to provide you some better advice for your tailored situation but it's the the majority of the time if we have to reject somebody from an apprenticeship program it's because they have already got higher level knowledge than they need for that program and we've got other options if that's the case you don't have to do via an apprenticeship program we can offer you something else but that's the number one reason why we have to say no okay perfect yeah makes sense um and it, we got we got some other questions interesting about how can i find apprenticeships in the area how can i get a level four apprenticeship for example um do you offer apprenticeships in sort of over, overseas countries so again like i alluded to earlier at the beginning of this uh, event there is a resource section on there so there'll be various links to find apprenticeship vacancies in your area uh, best to start that first of all um, have a look at the vacancies that are available in your area and then make progress from there as well um I'm just looking through some other questions uh, for yourself, Ryan and Amy, but it looks like, yeah, we, we sort of um, concluded most of the questions. Um, oh, okay, got another one here. Uh, it's all oh, similar, really. So it's, I was a chartered cheap teacher currently doing my level two in accounting. Would I qualify for an apprenticeship? That's interesting. A chartered cheap teacher. What do you say to that, Amy? It's not something I've come across before, but I would be interested to know their accounting experience. So what would happen from a training provider point of view when they're looking to sign somebody up? We'll ask you what qualifications you've got, what existing experience you've got, 
and we'll do what's called an initial assessment in your skills and behaviours. And it's those three things, along with those technical requirements of living in England and all of those aspects, it's those three things that we would look to make that assessment. So if as a chartered teacher, you've got lots and lots of experience in skills and behaviours and don't need any further training, unlikely to be on an apprenticeship programme. If you're doing your level two and you've passed that, you're not going to go on to a level two apprenticeship. You'd have to go on to a level three as a minimum. So it kind of need a, the whole picture of someone's background to make that assessment. But I can't say sat here, a, level, a chartered teacher would mean you can't do an apprenticeship programme. You know, there's no such rule. Okay. okay, makes sense. Thank you so much for that again, Amy. Okay, well, it looks like we've answered um, pretty much all the questions on this. So apologies if we um, didn't get to answer in great detail. They're just conscious of time. Um, but I would like to take this time to thank everyone who sent in their questions in the chat, including everyone who's taken today. But we've hoped you enjoyed this face event, Becoming an Apprentice. Um, I would also like to thank our two special guests, Amy and Ryan from First Intuition, who also supported today's event. So just to let you know, we also have another event next week titled Top Tips to Becoming an Accessible Apprentice. That's on Wednesday, the 7th of February from between 12 and 1 p.m. So link is in the comment section. Please join us again. We look forward to seeing you there. Um, so thank you. Take care and wishing you the very best on your journey. Bye bye, everyone. Take care.